Welcome, everybody. Um, it's really nice to, to see you all, especially since we're spread over half the planet at the moment. Lots of oceans in between you all, so <laughs> that makes our job more interesting in, in many ways. Um, you know, the, our, our theme is uh, Pacific Ocean personhood, uh, the ethical, cultural, and legal framework. And um, this is what we're going to look at today. And I thought that we'd start off with Dame Meg Taylor, who's on the board of several organizations in Papua New Guinea, her home, and is also an advisor to uh, Vanuatu as they lay their claim before the World Court on climate change issues. And uh, you'll see her, uh, her full, um, her shortened uh, bio later. But um, she, Dame Meg was also twice Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, and also concurrently the Pacific Oceans Commissioner. Uh, her, degrees are, her, uh, her legal degrees are from Melbourne and Harvard. Uh, but anyway, I'd like to ask uh, Dame Meg, what is that exactly, what is the seascape like in terms of things that we have to do to get uh, recognition of the Pacific Ocean as, as, a, as, a, as a person? Um, thank you very much, Soleil, and thank you for, for including me in this discussion. And there's wiser heads around this uh, this table than I am, and it's a little bit of a uh, misnomer when I'm 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 a Highlander, so I always look at the world from high high highlands to high seas. So um, just want to put that in context. With regard to the personhood, I think that we have to have a very strong narrative about who we are, and and I um, just wanted to raise some of the issues that I've been thinking of and I've just and, and I'd written some stuff on it for something else that I was doing about our, about identity and how we get to that. And I'm sure that if I just uh, go through what I have, and if I may, I'm just going to turn my video off. Um, and then we can explore it with what others are going to contribute. But if we go, if we need to look at a, a person, I think that part of the context is that we've got to have a narrative that we can explain for ourselves, but also for others who uh, will be wanting to understand us, who we are. So historically, um, I think we've been defined, uh, this region has been defined by many others. And we are always known for some for this reason of being tiny, vulnerable nations, you know, lacking resources, dependent on other countries, and restricted by our vast ocean. So we go to those definitions that we've had given to us as South Seas, Oceania, but also more recently in terms of the geopolitics that's going on and the United Nations defining us as part of Asia, um, which I know for some, for many Pacific people. Uh, it's not a real clarity about where we're sitting on all this. I want, and if we look also at scholars, writers, poets, and how they've defined us, going back to people like Apeli Haofa, but also particularly a lot of the young, young uh, poets in our region now, and a lot of them from Micronesia, which is really interesting. Um, on who we are, and it's written around climate issues and where we stand in all this. But I think that um, taking us forward, just want to emphasize that in 2017, you know, the Pacific leaders um, did call for a narrative uh, on, on the Pacific, and we, we defined it as the Blue Pacific continent. And the Blue Pacific it seeks to recapture the collective potential of our, our shared stewardship. Um, and it's based um, on an explicit recognition of our shared ocean identity, ocean geography and ocean resources. And its aim was to strengthen the collective action as one blue, uh, one blue Pacific continent. And by putting the blue Pacific at the center of policy making and collective action. And you may note that in many dialogues that we have, the people, our leaders particularly, and some of our partners are now referred to that Blue Pacific. But the notion of continent, I think, is still very much um, a distant concept for some of them. So it's more than a geographic, it's more than a geopolitical vision. 
It's about who we are as people and the peoples of, of, of this continent. And it speaks to a common regional identity that's grounded uh, in, vast, in, the, in the vast ocean and the spirit that, that set uh, our ancestors to explore it and to make it our home. So what is this regional identity? And we can, I'm, I'm sure many of you are much more learned in this than I am, but my um, suggestion is that at the heart of it, it's about uh, relationality, you know, the connection of people to ocean and land and land to ocean and people in, encompassing uh, all of life and the relational links to land and ocean, which are stored in our beliefs and knowledge systems uh, managed uh, by our concept of time, reproduced through our rituals and ceremonies and spoken through songs and poems. Uh, this is familiar to you all as people from the Pacific and it, it can be, you know, we can elaborate on this. The interesting thing, uh, issue uh, matter too, is that the smaller the island and island and, la and land, it appears uh, the more intensive are the interactions with ocean and the more pronounced are the ocean influences on culture. Um, and for those of you from smaller islands uh, know this better than I do. But even from where I sit um, and my home in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, you know, the, the, shells of the, the shells from the ocean have played a very important role in shaping our cultural ceremonies, but also our cultural economies going in the past. We've got many pan-Pacific concepts, while not the same in all our countries and languages. It's a broad understanding about, such as mana representing the sense of our spiritual efficacy, agency and authority of power, tapu, tabu, sacred or taboo things, people and practice and places, va, the relational space, manoa, uh, moana, the ocean as material, pragmatic, connective and sacred, and one solwara, the Pacific as a region shaped by shared kinship. But um, I just wanted to be clear here that uh, the Pacific is not culturally hom homogenous, far from it. Our diverse, our diverse cultures are far too strong for any regional identity ever to erase them, nor would we want, want that to happen. No? But our, diver our, our diversity uh, from Micronesia, Polynesia and Melanesia um, is, is strong and, and, and the regional identity uh, must draw on that so that we can act together. Yes, as um, somebody said, two things that islanders agree on 100%. One is uh, on how similar they are to the islands, you know, downstream a little bit. And the only other thing they can agree on completely is how completely different they are from the islanders downstream. <laughs> to your point about um, uh, regionalism and sub-regionalism and getting approvals and consensus on such big issues. But if you look over our history, you'll look as we pull together, particularly on the nuclear free Pacific issues, um, on the ocean's waste, more recently in terms of disposal, um, just going to happen uh, much more with the intention of Japan in terms of dumping um, water waste, etc. Uh, we've been very strong on the testing in Mururo and places like that. But the one place where we are now, I mean, on, on climate change, the Pacific is a strong and united voice. Uh, there are other issues like deep sea mining that are emerging now where there are divisions within our, within our society because driven by what we, uh, our countries want for economic development. But you know, I, think that, I think that we've got to look at the, the, the philosophies that really hold us together as one people. Um, When it comes to the issue of climate, I think that's a whole other area that we've got to explore and deep sea mining because these, uh, what the initiatives that are happening around climate, particularly from atoll countries and the Tuvalu, and, and uh, Tuloma may speak on this, but the Tuvalu's um, impressive Future Now projects, you know, speaking to ways of really strengthening um, their, their identity, um, through different mechanisms that they've engaged in. And I'm not going to go into that unless somebody asks a question on it later, just from what I've read and written. But um, I think that deep, uh, our positions on climate issues and deep sea mining, that's part of the narrative that we've got to have in terms of our, pers of our personhood. Because I think they're very different 
on climate, we're unified, but on deep sea mining, there are different approaches to this. I'm not going into other issues in terms of waste and fisheries, etc. I think that that is something that can be fed in if you want it. But I'm just trying to set the stage about of what is the narrative that we want to tell the world of who we are and our differences, but our unity uh, as an ocean continent so that we can put that argument of personhood forward. I'll leave it at that. And well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very, very clear and, um, and a definitive statement that uh, 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 roadmap, if you like, on what we have to do. And it's, uh, uh, I'm glad you also referenced that there are other things down the line with such as deep sea mining which of course is going to be a, a huge issue and thanks also for mentioning the two, uh, 2017 uh, UN Oceans Conference when um, uh, Prime Minister Henry Puna of the Cooks, Cook Islands um, announced that it was time to start looking at um, uh, putting together some sort of international agreement recognizing the personhood of the oceans. This was one of the great motivators for our great uh, Yuki Kihara, who put uh, who, who put all this whole initiative together, and uh, also the fact that you know Ecuador has given uh, rights to nature, and then um, Aotearoa and New Zealand, of course, uh, recognise the Whanganui River as as a living being, as um, as did uh, India with the Ganges and the um, and um, you know the most important river in their. Um, in, in, their, um, in their culture, along with the Yunamuna, of course. But uh, you know, so there's, there's movement there, which is important. But going back to your point about getting, getting um, you know, identifying you know, our cultural, ethical, and historical uh, differences, perhaps, um, this is where I'd like to bring in uh, Katerina, and uh, who has uh, studied a lot of the, the genealogy, if you like, of um, of the of the narratives which have emerged, you know, in the past, and also other narratives which are ongoing. So, uh, Katerina, would you um, like to take the floor? You know, Katerina is the professor of Pacific Studies at the Australian National University, uh, who researches an enormous amount of um, of material on the genealogy of of uh, the decision making regarding the Pacific, and she's also an artist who has uh, exhibits on Turing and um, especially one which is about the shameful Banaba situation uh, in the Pacific, which of course uh, focuses attention on something which is little noticed in other parts of the world. Katerina, the other, the floor is yours. Vinaka, Korapa, Lele, and Kamna Maori, Ni Sambula Vinaka, everyone. Um, it's a real honor uh, to sit here in Talanoa with you. Um, and lovely to meet um, uh, Tuiloma and Dame Meg for the first time as well. Um, and Lele, thank you so much uh, for moderating this session. And I know Joy quite well, um, and I'm so excited that um, she's here with us today. Um, I'm coming to you uh, from Melbourne. Uh, so I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands in which I am zooming in from. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people um, and I also want to uh, you know underscore that these lands were never ceded and also I regularly work on the lands of the um, Ngunnawal um, and the Nambri peoples in Canberra whose lands were also never ceded. Um, as much as we are you know talking about the ocean when we when we talk about the ocean and we talk about place we are also talking about the land the land and the sea are deeply connected and when we think of place we're thinking of both of them um, so the ways in which we care for our oceans and our small islands um, very similar to the way indigenous peoples care for and are connected to their lands here in the big island of Australia um, so just want to acknowledge that. Um, so I have been teaching uh, in Pacific Studies for a very long time and came out of a, you know, the Center for Pacific Island Studies uh, program at the University of Hawaii. And that's where I learned or started to learn this incredible genealogy of thought um, and of um, thinking and naming and framing and rethinking and reconstructing our ideas about the Pacific, our connections to the ocean and what that means 
politically, socially, culturally, economically, especially when we're often more focused, you know, locally or in the places that we come from, uh, maybe locally, provincially, our nation states, but how to think about who we are between our islands, the ways in which we're connected across nation state boundaries or across uh, the really big, vast ocean gaps between our islands. Um, and so uh, uh, Emeg has already mentioned, um, you know, people like Apeli Ofa, who are critical to this thinking. But I suppose what I want to em emphasize here is that the details of these ideas and the histories behind them really do matter. So it's, it's very interesting in the present to see these concepts and these ideas of belonging to Oceania invoked in really serious and important geopolitical and regional contexts. And those of us who have been in Pacific studies for a long time um, really care that we all know the, the deep histories behind these ideas and even a bit more about the disciplines or the interdisciplinary spaces from which they come. Um, when I went to start my PhD at the ANU, um, and I don't know how, but unfortunately I chose anthropology as the field to do my PhD in, um, I was walking the, the halls of the Coombs the very famous Coombs building um, at the ANU, which is very well known for producing a lot of research, a lot of thinking, a lot of writing, historical, linguistic, archeological work about the Pacific um, and had been doing it since 1947. I, I went to open one of the doors of the offices that I was going to be in to start my PhD. And I noticed the door tag and I thought, Oh, um, I noticed that they were recycling door tags. So people were like, oh, you could just flip the door tag and you write your name on the other side. And I was like, oh, this is great. We don't need new, new door tags. And we just keep using what we've been using forever. And I flipped the door tag and it said, Epeli Haofa. And I was like, wow, this was 20 years after um, Epeli had been uh, doing his PhD at the ANU in the Coombs building, but there was traces still of him um, in those hallways. And so this was very significant for me coming out of uh, from UH, where we had been reading and thinking a lot about our Sea of Islands, his very formative piece uh, written in 1993, kind of reframing and rethinking everything about Oceania. Um, and, I, and we had all been reading about how that was connected to Albert Wendt's work and his writing uh, many years earlier um, in a project that I think uh, had to do with UNESCO. And at a time when a lot of people in the region were trying to say who they were to the world, to the bigger world, not just saying they were Tongan Samoan and Fijian or even Melanesian, Micronesian and Polynesian, but were saying we belong to Oceania. We are rooted in this ocean. So even before Epeli was Albert Wendt, um, Albert Wendt's literary writing and poetry and a whole range of poets and activists and scholars, as um, they mentioned, who are all thinking in this really critical, deeply engaged way about who we were and where we were coming from. Now, what's, what's relevant to what's going on now is that genealogy of those voices and their, the way they thought, the way they related to each other and the way they were able to belong to Oceania in this very multi-sited, multi-scalar, very dynamic and complex way. I think has been lost a bit over time through globalization, through development, through all the different structural ways in which um, international, uh, uh, colonial, the forces of global empire have tried to reshape the Pacific and change us structurally, tell us that we, we need to go and study, you know, health, business, law, and economics 
in order to and science to to further um, you know to develop to be civilized to uh, exist in a in a efficacious way with our capacities built in the present that's all happened in the period from when Albert went and Epeli Haofa wrote their powerful and amazing pieces which now the ideas and the concepts are being taken up today because we've all suddenly realized these aren't just about imaginations. These aren't just about interesting, creative conceptions of the Pacific that we can all connect to, but there, there's a real material basis and real material consequences for not claiming Oceania, not deeply connecting to Oceania and being able to have these complex identities so that we can push back against the other kinds of framings that have really um, caused chaos um, in our region and confused Pacific people regularly, <laughs> historically over various periods of time and, and caused us to question who we are and what we're supposed to do and how shall we do it? And most importantly, do we have the capacity to do this ourselves? We're constantly being told from the entry of Europeans into the Pacific to the present that we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we don't know everything, we need technical assistance, we need legal assistance, we need scientific assistance because we just can't do it ourselves somehow magically after being in the region, you know, uh, 40,000 plus years in Papua New Guinea and 6,000 plus years in other parts of the Pacific. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious we know the best way to live in large bodies of water. So these narratives, these competing narratives and these competing names and frames and ways of conceptualizing the Pacific and who we are and renaming and reframing, telling us, for example, that we're Melanesians, Micronesians and Polynesians, um, you know, changing the names of our islands. Uh, I come from Banaba, which is right near the equator, right in the middle of the Pacific. Um, Banaba means the rock. We are the people of the rock. Um, we were renamed Ocean Island, which is actually not too bad. I'm, I, I like Ocean Island because we get to then belong to the ocean and belong to the rock simultaneously. But it matters that, you know, the way we describe things and our languages were undermined in this process of restructuring and reframing. So ideas, you know, like the Indo-Pacific, for example, or even Asia Pacific, these mean nothing you know, two people from the Pacific, but everyone's like got them enshrined in policy, in aid and development uh, packages, plans and programs in defense and security, Re like things with real big, serious, hard consequences for the Pacific. These names and these concepts really, really matter. So one of the things I am concerned about, and I think is important going forward with our with our big ideas of belonging to the ocean is that we also need to like reclaim and encourage young people especially to go back into fields like history and the arts, um, cultural studies, uh, gender studies, the humanities, all these spaces that actually delivered us these concepts because of the critical thinkers who came through it, for me, it's not good enough for them, for, for the humanities and for poets and artists to create these ideas and then for scientists and technical experts and politicians then to just take them and go, oh, thank God we've got this. Good. Let's take this. Let's take it to the world. We need to acknowledge that this comes from the brilliance and the fabulousness and the creative thinking of people who have come before us and we need to continue. That is our space of empowerment. That's where we have real self-determination and sovereignty over our own thoughts and our own ideas. When I first came to ANU, what, what we call the Melanesianists, which is all the Europeans who study Melanesia told me, you come from that, those Oceania, you come from those, that Oceania corner of Pacific studies. And you know what? Oceania is irrelevant in Papua New Guinea. 
everyone in Papua New Guinea, they don't care about all this oceanic stuff. So they immediately created this like barrier and boundary between Micronesians and Polynesians and Melanesians. And that allowed them to do a lot of stuff and a lot of thinking about Melanesia that increased that border and boundary and ability to claim belonging to Oceania. So these, these ways of talking about the Pacific and the careers and the, you know, the, the structures that have been built off of divide and conquer have had real, real consequences um, for, for people today, including needing to navigate then really, really big things like climate change, um, which, which kind of like push us to come back together and work together and talk to each other. Um, so I guess just to wrap up, I get, you know, my, my part of uh, thinking about this, I want to encourage everyone to actually do, do things like Pacific studies, even though all our parents, you know, uh, and aunties, uncles and everyone else would have said, why on earth would you need to study the Pacific? That's what other people do. We know the Pacific, we know our culture, we know our languages, we know everything. Don't spend your time at university or spend your time at school learning about the Pacific. It's the exact opposite. We need to spend all our time, all our time, learning and thinking and reclaiming ideas about the Pacific. Because right now, globally, there is a rush for the Pacific. There is a mad rush for the Pacific. They're all here, <laughs> all wanting something from the Pacific as they have for centuries. So it's really critical that we like take back um, our own ideas and our own approaches and thinking and strategies and get ourselves out of kind of a victimhood mentality or a um, deficit mentality around who we are, what we need, how we will do it and where we will find the ideas and the resources and the inspiration. Uh, to do what we need to do. So for me, education, you know, primary school, high school and tertiary education is such a critical space for us to be encouraging young people to be more engaged with these ideas. I meet so many fabulous, smart Pacific people at the ANU doing anything but Pacific studies. They're doing everything but Pacific studies. And they look at me like, why would I do that? That's not gonna get me a job. I'm like, it'll get you a job and it'll also help you survive in this world where the ocean matters so much more, is so critical. Um, so we need to not just change the identity narratives, but also these narratives around what are real skills? What are real, what is the real basket of resources and strategies, techniques and approaches that we can assemble for ourselves, for our children, for future generations? And it's gotta be a real interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary basket with, with indigenous knowledges, traditional knowledges, the arts, law, everything, everything has to be in that basket. And that was how it was for us um, for, for generations and for centuries anyway. Katharina, it's easy to see why you were declared the Australian University's Teacher of the Year. You, 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 you were such a good teacher. I wish I had you, uh, in that case, taking Pacific Studies rather than some stupid thing. But, you know, I did study history and I'm always reminded when people dismiss um, Pacific uh, technological feats of Arnold Toynbee in his uh, seminal book, The Studies of History, he said that the fact that the Pacific Islanders managed to establish regular maritime traffic, regular maritime traffic over six to seven million square miles of the Pacific Ocean, he said that in looking at the degree of difficulties, especially with these small vessels, and the distances they had to go, the science that they had to uh, 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 synthesize to be able to get to these places regularly, he said that is the greatest technological feat known to human and can only be equaled when there's regular interstellar traffic, mm. regular traffic between the stars. So this is always, you know, people dismiss lots of things but from the Pacific, but, you know, even now, you only get Nainoa traveling around the world. 
using traditional Pacific uh, navigational techniques, these sort of stuff. Um, it never gets out there, and I'm glad that people like you are doing it. And it also makes me think that, you know, is there a growing body of, of thought that perhaps Pacific peoples should go back and start reviving the tradition as the ways that we used to learn, that is through storytelling? How important is this through, as we move forward? Oh, it's absolutely critical and I think it's already happening and has been happening you know at various institutions and, and organizations in, in places like Hawaii you know through Hawaiian studies, Pacific studies, through indigenous studies programs all over the world. So um, in North America um, lot, there are lots of amazing new programs that are based in, in traditional knowledge, in, in indigenous knowledges, both tangible and intangible uh, forms of heritage that are doing this work in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Australia. I think the really interesting thing is that it's often being done in those places where they, where they are still settler, settler colonial contexts, rather than in those places that are in the independent Pacific, like in, you know, Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, all the independent countries of the Pacific. There's this pattern over time of the independent nation states kind of saying, we don't need to do that because we're not colonized anymore and our languages are fine and our, I, our identities are fine. And those, um, you know, in places like Hawaii or in Aotearoa or in Australia or who are still uh, settler colonial context saying, no, 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 we need to really focus on the things, the values, the approaches that matter to us because they see the, the, the potential and the uh, impact of loss. Um, so I think this is part of the issue in Oceania is that sometimes our independent, independent states are not valuing some of this content and that sometimes culture is dismissed as something that doesn't happen and exist in formal education or in higher education context. It's something you do at home, it's something outside, but this is the very thing that's being eroded and culture is the very source of all of those amazing and fabulous ideas that we've been referring to about how to think about identities in a complex way. So there is, however, you know, revitalization of voyaging practices, navigation by the stars and things like that. That's been happening for a while now um, in the Pacific. Uh, it's been happening in the exchange of traditional knowledges between Micronesia and Polynesia, for example. And then the, of course there are places in the Pacific that never lost, never lost these, uh, skills and these knowledge systems that none of us acknowledge and never have heard of and they just get on with their lives. Um, and then there are also places like Palau who even though they have a degree of independence, they're all, always at the forefront of American geopolitical strategic thinking. So that has inspired them to continue to value both Western forms of education and traditional knowledge and have that um, happen together for for young, you know, primary school, secondary school, and tertiary um, student study. So I've I've taken my students to Palau, and we've talked with students there, and we've followed people around looking at um, old stone money, and you know, some of these big like uh, historical things in Palau, and they very much value uh, these sorts of ideas, and are are ensuring they don't lose. Um, those values and those connections to culture. And they're able to balance it in a really good way with everything else, with democracy and with science and you know, all of those things we're told we need to, to follow. So what you said is really important, absolutely going forward. Well, Fatai Katarina for that uh, wonderful exposition. And we hope to listen to your storytelling for as long as you can talk. Uh, moving over to Hawaii now, there's been a lot of discussion in Hawaii, um, to, but before I bring on Joy Liwana Nani in Amoto, I'd like to recount that um, several years ago, I was invited to address the, the large security conference, Pacific security conference in Hawaii. It was all military from all over the place, but uh, no Pacific uh, military there. And so I said, listen, you know, you folks, uh, um, 
you know, you may think that we Pacific Island, Islands uh, are just a bunch of out, uh, rocks outcropped from the ocean, but you know what? Technology now allows us to see to the base of, 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 of the ocean. So we consider these just the tips and that we are consider ourselves an aquatic continent. And so as such, we think that it's aquatic continent. If the United States can control who flies over their territory um, without even touching it, we as aquatic continentals should be able to determine who can sail in our, in our waters over our continent. So I said that uh, we now consider ourselves an aquatic continent and very, very soon, in order to reclean and demilitarize our, our aquatic continent, we will bring down the coconut curtain all over the Pacific and just have two or three entry points for, uh, for, for, for sh shipping to come in and for our goods and services to go out. And of course, that got a huge amount of um, non-applause from the uh, gathered security people and a bit of a cold shoulder from the State Department afterwards. But uh, somebody who's accustomed to the ways of the military in Hawaii and other parts of the Pacific is Joy. And Joy is an artist and uh, whose uh, art and scholarship has been featured and recognized in many organizations and their publications. And um, but she's an amazing activist who's managed to uh, um, move so many people in her way to, to move towards the demilitarization of, of, of the archipelago. Joy, welcome and tell us, you know, how bad is it? I mean, people never ever hear of massive military exercises and it sounds as though that with the amount of uh, military damage being, um, the Pacific is being subjected to in that sort of area, it sounds as though it's still very much in a war over there. What's the story? Oh, we have we need to have lots of time for this car, this conversation. But uh, aloha mai kako. Uh, I'm Joy Lehonani in Amoto. I I also come out of Pacific Island Studies. It's uh, an honor to meet you, uh, Tui Loma, and uh, to to see you again, uh, Dame Meg. Uh, but to meet you again. Um, I I work currently for. Um, Hawaii Peace and Justice and uh, organizations like Hawaii Peace and Justice, I'm sure people have heard of the Oahu Water Protectors uh, and uh, Kohohewai and different uh, Hawaiian organization, grassroots organizations that have been, who come out of the legacy of NFIP, I should say, uh, who have been organizing against well, let's let's just go back. The United States the United States illegally occupies the Hawaiian Islands, which is exactly why we're not in the Pacific Islands Forum, right? We're not we're not in places that we're supposed to be. We're not we're not allowed to enter these conversations because the people that show up are the people that occupy us, and that occupation began with the U.S. military. Uh, and so when we think about Hawaii and we were beginning with a, a conversation about deoccupation, but when we go to this conversation around oceanic personhood, doesn't the ocean have a right to not be devastated by military by military exercises? And so in Hawaii, we have the largest maritime war exercises in the world every two years. In fact, we just had one this year, 26 nations including nations that are known for their human rights and genocide violations, such as Indonesia, such as Israel, uh, you know, the United States, Australia, right, uh, France, uh, and I can go on and on, uh, you know, Japan is here. Uh, and, and there's only, I think Tonga is one of the only few actual Pacific nations directly involved. The impact that this has on the ocean, which people have not, it's been going on since 1971, every two years, is that there are, there's the explosion of, of old ships, right? There's the sink X exercises, there's amphibious assaults onto the coastlines, there is jungle warfare, there is uh, live fire training that is happening on our most sacred Mauna, uh, Mauna Kea. Uh, there is such a an onslaught of violence that comes through these exercises, and that's just the exercises. 
That's not also including all of the other live fire trainings that go on throughout the year. And so when I think about this idea of, when we think about the, the ocean, the ocean meets the, the estuaries, the estuary meets the river, the river goes, is fed from the mountain. There, so we need to think about it as an entire archi archipelagic system that when we think about oceanic personhood, the entire archipelagic system needs, has a right to be protected and not be violated. Our live fire training, the, the US Navy, you know, the US Navy exists and has always existed to protect American trade lanes and trade routes and extraction. That is what the military in the Pacific does. It is there to protect American interests for us, right? But when we look at the, the, the kind of super connecting that's going on in the so-called in Pacific, Indo-Pacific with Australia, right? Uh, the posturing that is now reoccurring, uh, like similar to World War II in the Solomon Islands, in Papua New Guinea, in all, in, in back returning to Melanesia, people forget that before uh, the, the Dutch in West Papua, there was a US base. Mm -hmm. There was a US base there. People forget that that the Solomon Islands is still cleaning up unexploded ordinances and being devastated by unexploded ordinances from the U.S.'s presence in World War II in the Solomon Islands in the Guadal in Guadalcanal. People forget about all of those Melanesian connections of the United States and their military and the way that they're now returning and posturing. And many people don't know, uh, or, or people may know, that the U.S. Navy, uh, their their Red Hill storage facility, that was a, a fuel facility that was built during World War II. It took them three years to build it in World War II. Holds 250 billion gallons of fuel. Leaked 27,000 gallons of jet fuel, contaminating the water resources of its own military, of its own sailors. Uh, and also civilians, it, it, it impacted 93,000 people. Those tanks exist in the largest freshwater aquifer in Hawaii, I mean, in Oahu, that supplies the freshwater to over 70% of the island, which means that from Halava to as far as um, Kahala, like past Kahala, is who would be impacted if they break the water table with this fuel? And they're telling us that it's going to take almost two years to clean up. The thing that it took them no time at all to build as an engineering marvel in World War II, with all of the technology and all of the, we have the largest military budget in the world. It's large, our, our one military budget is larger than nearly every Pacific economy in the, like anywhere. Right, I don't. I don't know anybody next to, except for Australia, that even comes close to our military budget for their whole economy, for their whole budget. So when I think about how little they're, how what little, how 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 relaxed they are with with an existential, what is what is an existential crisis for us, how they're treating the threat of contaminating our water supply for all time like it's just another engineering problem in the same way that they so casually dumped nuclear waste in the Marshall Islands with a con concrete cap. And they're telling the Marshall Marshallese that they need to clean up the, the waste that they left from the testing that they did while they've already been displaced and harmed and now have to come to Hawaii for sanctuary for, for medical care, which is also underfunded, which is also being blamed on them. Uh, we need to look very seriously. We cannot talk about oceans. We cannot talk about islands without talking about the military. And the reason they don't want us to talk about these things, the reason that they want, they don't want us to go into Pacific study. You know where, where I learned the most about, about the military in the Pacific? Pacific studies. You know where I learned the most about conflict? Pacific studies. Do you know where? I, so these things are all interconnected. We can't honestly, uh, the conversations around the role that China plays, Pacific studies, the real interventions around how we 
fight and strengthen our narratives around uh, around a person around the ocean around a, but it's not just the ocean right so i think that they want us they actually want us to limit it to just the ocean i'm like the ocean <clears throat> it's the it's the it's the mountain like as long as they're te- as long as they we have one of the largest when they shut down Ko Olave in hawaii it all moved to pokolo on mauna kea right five times larger they didn't really want Kuala Lave. They wanted Mauna, they wanted Park Law. Now, as the United States Army is coming up for leases in 2029, that the leases that they paid a dollar a year for a 65-year lease, they want to renew it and they're trying to renew it early. But somehow that little oil, that little jet fuel spill, it's not putting them in the best, it's not putting the military in Hawaii in the best light, right? What we do is put a light, right? We, over the summer, um, Kohevai, an organization called Kohevai, called for a 10-day occupation of Pearl Harbor to bring attention not only to Red Hill, but to Renpak, which was here, right? People think that, and, and what was also being left out of this narrative is the amount of weapons fairs, innovation fairs, all of the funding that goes to military development that is happening. Australia just had an incredibly large weapons fair. We're about to, for anyone who's going to watch this, have another one in Hawaii at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. So we see that the militarism, violence of weapons affairs also go hand in hand with tourism. It's part of the package, right? The militarism that, um, uh, Oh my God, I'm in Tewa uh, coined. Um, I can't believe I just spaced out that name. I'm so sorry, Gati. I was like, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the um, That relationship is so intertwined and taken for granted. So when we ask how bad is it, it's so much worse than people know. And that's that's me really even speaking on the surface. That's not me naming the the files and files and files and files of the the amounts of attempts of intervention in military buildup just in Hawaii, which is what we consider the head of the octopus, right? The head of the he'e that has its tentacles that impacts Okinawa, Guahan, right? The Marshalls, Palau, like all of these places. Palau has a certain amount of autonomy, but it's still considering allowing a base to come in. Why? Because of Kofa, right? There is always these tentacles that keep us from really asserting who has the right to our oceans, right? But what's great about places like the Solomons is that they can say, well, you know what? We are actually independent. Guess what? Your, your, your ships don't get to dock here. How about that, right? There is some, there is some strength. There is some, some, some great leverage in being independent and being able to uh, to challenge uh, powers like Australia and New Zealand and France and, and America in the Pacific. Uh, and that's just me. I'm not even talking about, you know, Japan and, you know, like all these other different entities. Because we are the last place that has the most resources that they need. They've, right? Uh, we've, we still have rich mineral resources, right? Even to do deep sea mining would have to, in, in effect, be militarized, right? Because they have no right to that. You know, the laws of the sea don't allow them to have a right to the bottom of the sea. What gives you the right to our origin? For Hawaii, that's where we begin. You don't have the right to play and devastate our pole. You don't have that right. So the, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, questions, these, these struggles, uh, in taking on such a large, you know, multi-armed thing, uh, uh, creature, so to speak, it can be it can be handled, but it does it does require incredible levels of regional solidarity uh, and alliance, right? So I don't know if we're we're now advocating. I'm definitely ad- advocating for a new Pacific summit, a new a new a new form of NFIP. Uh, a new a new birth of of taking in the lessons that were learned from NFIP and what is necessary for the now of this current of this new buildup of this 
of this insane level of more than 50% of the discretionary funds of the United States budget going to militarism. Uh, and where does Hawaii fit into and, and when Hawaii gets, right, when we have our sovereignty restored, right, then we can say, no, we're not playing these games, right? So that's why independence and sovereignty is so crucial because we, but we can always and never forget that we are part of the Pacific first and fr foremost. And in that we can develop those relationships independent of the United States, which we have had to do. But it, it prevent, but in a geopolitical realm, it prevents us from actually being to, able to enter a lot of the spaces that where we should be. And so, you know, uh, I'll just leave that at that. I'm not sure if you have another oh question. My God. Joy, that is a staggering presentation. I'd like to thank you very much for that. But also, you know, that point that, you know, if the ocean doesn't have rights, then those like the military, they think that they have a right to do whatever they want with the ocean. So that's an interesting point that you brought out, and I hope that it's retained later on. Um, well, in terms of looking at alliances and international treaties and the efficacy of them, and also just the pure anguish of getting any agreement through, especially through Lord of the Sea, which is what uh, Tuloma and Hironi Slate has um, great experience in. Um, um, this, this is why I'd like to seek his, his advice and counsel on what do we do next? What's the, what's the best approach? You know, is it regionalism? And how do we, how do we merge the, um, the parameters, if you like, of Western legal systems with our own natural, you know, sort of a traditional systems? So, um, as you know, Tuiloma is um, one of the most distinguished legal lines that we've produced out of the Pacific, um, in, in addition to being um, two times uh, Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum. He has presented cases to the World Court. That was before the International Court of Justice elected him to be on to be one of the first judges appointed to the International Criminal Court. And he still is uh, very busy with regional and other uh, activities. And this is why it's, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Tuloma, Tuloma, what do we need? How do you, you know, I mean, the struggle to get the law of the sea through, that was torturous, <laughs> torturous and torturous. Um, so what can we do? You know, you know about regionalism, where it works and where it doesn't work. And uh, as people have pointed out, it works for some things and not for others. How do you think we should approach the legal ramifications of declaring uh, the Pacific uh, a person. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, wonderful hearing those very um, extensive thoughts, very learned um, ideas. Uh, Dame Meg, uh, wonderful to see you again. Um, I've seen something uh, that now seems to be describing you as a politician. I, um, I hadn't tracked on the media that you stood for parliament in the recent elections, whatever it is, if should you be in fact uh, be a politician, uh, all good wishes for that. <laughs> um, uh, Katerina, uh, in particular, uh, uh, really wonderful to put face to a name uh, and, and thank you for what you have said. Um, I'm delighted um, after all these years to, to meet someone um, from Banaba. Uh, um, I've been down to the, uh, the, the well, uh, the, um, the cave in Banaba. The Banga Banga. Uh, and, and I, um, I, I feel rather lucky that I'm able to be here and to speak with you because I had rather um, almost desperate at the time when I was down there, I was a, a little bit bigger uh, and I found it rather difficult to climb back up that hole. Um, I, uh, when I was working in London, uh, I had the uh, rather perhaps a rare privilege of um, coming to your country as counsel assisting uh, the Constitutional Commission, which uh, is mandated under the Constitution of Kiribati uh, on Banaba. So I, I, I came to assist the commission and um, spent about three weeks of 
my life in York, um, in uh, Tarawa, and then we came across to the island. Anyway, uh, thank you all, Lele, <clears throat> uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I wonder if I may begin with really uh, some salutary uh, comments on um, uh, to support uh, most strongly, I think the central uh, point that has been made, uh, we do need uh, a, a, an effective narrative uh, on this matter. And I think um, uh, to me, to just to go first to that, I, I do feel that uh, the narrative without question needs to be very clear. We need not to be uh, self-conscious about a Pacific narrative on the importance, the centrality of the ocean. Uh, we need to not to be uh, unnecessarily parochial uh, in the emphasis on smallness and vulnerability. Indeed, we are small communities. We are extremely vulnerable communities. But this is well recorded in the annals of the United Nations. Uh, in the pronouncement, many pronouncements of our own region. These things are valid, uh, legitimate, and available as official, official records. They need not be self-consciously uh, projected any further, in my view. The narrative needs to be very uh, positive, I feel, not one that continues to seek assistance, handouts, dependence on partnerships. Indeed, we need all that. But rather underscoring the le legitimacy of our position and claims uh, for due legal and political recognition uh, of our ocean and of our legitimate entitlements uh, to the benefits for the, our ocean and for for the protection of our ocean, our home, and the expectations that we have for all the reasons that all of you have put forward. Culturally, the sacredness of it, the spirituality of the ocean as the provider and the heritage of our being civilizations on the three of the major Pacific cultures. Um, and moreover, I think the narrative ought to be a very clear statement of the Pacific um, contribution uh, to the ocean and the development of the ocean. Um, uh, now, uh, as uh, you will all know, um, it's, a, it's a given that the oceans is critical to all countries and communities. Um, it's critical to the global environment, to humanity as a whole. Now remember, there are 193 countries, at least those that are officially members of the United Nations. Amongst them, 12 landlocked countries. The ocean remains as critical to the landlocked states as they are to islands. These are countries with access and cooperation rights under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the ocean is without question critical to humanity. Um, the um, I think, moderator and uh, colleagues, it's necessary to recall some history uh, to many. Um, the oceans had long been subjected to the freedom of the seas doctrine, uh, a principle, one of European origin in the 16th, maybe the 17th century. Uh, which limits national rights and jurisdiction over the ocean to a narrow belt of sea surrounding the coastline. And under that doctrine, 
the remainder of the seas was proclaimed to be free to all and belonging to no one. Now, at that time, it is said, um, the regime of the oceans was about money and power. The power of maritime nations uh, with the means to dominate the seas and to dominate much else. And to this day, I think we see dominance, that sort of dominance of the major maritime nations. And, uh, and its dominance, uh, which Joy has described in appalling dimensions. Uh, Joy, I don't know whether you'd ever been to Tuvalu. It's a very small country. Uh, virtually half of Tuvalu uh, was dug up uh, to build an airstrip during the last war. And it left an awful ditch, which prevented really any, any practical or sensible uh, development or even housing. And it deprived that country virtually half, if not a very significant part of its land territory. Guess what? Nobody would fill it in post-war. Dame Meg, I don't know what's happened since. I think um, Tuvalu had ended up largely having to find the um, assistance to fill that uh, trench up. Um, I hope it has been done to date. But I think this sort of mirrors what you have been saying, Joy. Um, now, um, under the uh, current convention on the law of the sea, the constitution of the oceans as it is called, we now have a more modern or updated regime of governance of the oceans, at least as of its coming into force in 1982, uh, and the convention uh, developments uh, since. Um, now, um, I want to come back to this now because, I, as I said, my vision of the, a strong narrative is that to, we ensure that we give emphasis uh, to the, uh, the contributions that uh, the Pacific is capable of and that we have made to this particular area, the development of the ocean. Uh, the, as you know, the, uh, the ocean is so critical to everybody. Uh, the world community has had three goals at determining uh, what is an acceptable convention. They've done so in uh, 1958, uh, in 1960, and what uh, is now the uh, third UN convention is the third time they've done it. Only uh, a handful of then fully independent Pacific countries um, took part, uh, were able to play a part in that convention, uh, the first session of which began in the city of Caracas in 1974. And these were Fiji, Samoa, uh, 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 Tonga, and the Cook Islands. This was in 1974, and the rest of the Pacific countries had not become independent. So although we had some participation in it, uh, we were obviously not an influential segment of the conference. We did what we can uh, to contribute to the establishment of a regime of islands, uh, to the territorial sea with fishing rights, uh, to the adjective. Uh, the notion of archipelagic states um, and to um, the creation of a 200 mile um, exclusive economic zone. Now, the UNCLOS, of course, is only a framework convention. Um, in other words, it does not deal with it, everything 
although it's a very strong, very environmentally conscious and of strong environmental controls in the, um, in, in the convention, it came to at a time that we did not have the science uh, to make the predictions and the assessment we now have about climate change, for example. So very little of that is you can find in, in the, in the UNCLOS convention. There is very little on the massive biological um, uh, disaster that is happening uh, in the world today. Uh, nonetheless, it's an updated statement of the regime, and it's been built on uh, gradually uh, by supporting other instruments like the fishery on one on um, highly migratory fishery, fisheries. Um, at that time, in 1995, uh, there was a large, a very important uh, UN um, uh, conference chaired by the distinguished, late distinguished Fijian Ambassador Satyanandan, good friend of yours and mine, Lele. Um, and, and it was a wonderful turnout uh, of the most professional Pacific delegations from all of the Pacific uh, countries, supported by FFA, by, by um, the SPC, um, and I think uh, a, a fledgling but important contribution from SPREP. Uh, many of the uh, provisions of that uh, convent of the fisheries agreement uh, confirmed and reconfirmed important principles that had been gained from the first major Rio conference in 1992 on the environment and develop on development on principles like the precautionary approach um, and the development of what uh, those of you may know it is uh, chapter 17 of agenda 21. Now, chapter 17 of agenda 21 not only dealt with the general principles that had been approved by all countries of the world, but it also focused on the oceans and it also gave, highlighted the importance of SIDS. And in fact, that's a chapter that spoke and uh, of and confirmed the, um, the, uh, the, the SIDS uh, as a special case, special case for the environment and development. I would have to say that that special emphasis uh, in chapter 17 of Agenda 21, and I'm talking about 1992 when Agenda 21 was done, that reference to SIDS, small island states, developing states as a special case for the environment and development, we have since lost the emphasis on a special case for small island states for development. Uh, the reason for that, and if you'll see in, um, in um, I think, uh, Day Meg in, uh, in the goal number 14 on oceans uh, for the sustainable development goals, uh, there is a missing <laughs> reference of it. There was too much competition. Everybody argued that yes, island states are small and vulnerable, but we are as special uh, for development as these small countries. So there is this uh, reality that we would have to face when we at the appropriate time bring ocean ocean rights and personhood into the international community. This is a sort of competition that will always take place. Now, as I say, and I continue to focus on oceans, um, the UNCLOS III was not completed and, did not, and was not ratified and came into force until 1982. By 1979, 
Um, the Pacific, we're very concerned at the um, at 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 the huge amount of activity in our region um, and the taking of Pacific fisheries resources. And at the initiative of Papua New Guinea and Fiji, the Pacific leaders decided to establish the Forum Fisheries Agency. Those of you like Meg and me who have engaged in the work of the region will voice the proudest um, uh, comments for FFA and what FFA has done for our region in saving our valuable resources and the amazing and the massive uh, assistance they have received and what an efficient organization it is today. We made this move, created FFA in the face of large fishering fisheries from the United States in particular, and resulted in the um, enactment of the Magnus, what they call the Magnuson Act in Congress, uh, uh, because Solomon Islands had um, detained and arrested a very large American fishing vessel, and we upset the Americans very much. And um, but from then on, um, it brought some sense and reasonable response from major fishing nations to come and talk to us before taking the resources of our oceans and helping themselves to it. Now. Um, I mention this because uh, the creation of the FFA in 1979 had taken place by resolution and firm decision of our own Pacific leaders before the UNCLOS and the convention of UNCLOS had come into force. So we had quite a strong reaction from the United States and from other countries about our unilateral, what they call our unilateral actions uh, to take control of our ocean and the resources of our ocean at a time when they said international law had not been fully agreed on. Our counter argument given with determination with Pacific regional strength was no sir no thank you what we have done is because this is ours this is our territory and what we've done is in accordance with principle it's in accordance with international law it's in accordance with what was discussed in the making of UNCLOS that's the determination I mean that's the clarity that's the positivity I mean when we consider this narrative. We need to demonstrate to the international community that the Pacific countries were not sitting on their hands. The Pacific country had a, a voice. They had a right to protest, to protect the legitimacy of their positions, the preservations of their resources and they will do what the law allows us to do, to act together in unity, to protect and to project ourselves at the international level. That, Mr. Chairman, is the emphasis that I would seek uh, for a, a narrative, not one that is self-conscious, that is tentative, that is based on speculation, but rather on the record. Now, um, you ask me, what are the political and the legal um, pitfalls? Uh, my answer, respectfully, there are many, and there will be significant. 
Uh, the idea of personhood for the ocean is relatively new. I am aware uh, of the activities of uh, important organization. Is it Earth Law, I think, Earth Center? Earth Law, Earth Law says, yep. Yeah. Uh, of course, like you, I'm aware of the, their activities. Uh, of course, the wonderful initiative of Whanganui River uh, being given and given this recognition in uh, the national law and structure of our terror. But there are specific and distinguishing circumstances. I think that the particular uh, importance uh, for this uh, uh, initiative taken in, in uh, New Zealand is the presence of the Treaty of Waitangi and the very strong cultural traditions of the Maori people themselves. So we would not always find this in elsewhere, but I think in the, for our purposes, would, we would need to create it in our narrative. And what Joy and what Katerina and what they make have said, I think have got wonderful material uh, here for it. Realities, Mr. Chairman, moderator, when the European um, first navigators came to our region, they witnessed a peaceful calm, peaceful seas, and they gave our ocean the name Pacific. Wonderful. I wish it were so, and I'm sure you too would wish it were so. But alas, in just the past century, our part of the Pacific has been an active theater of war. Not about doing, but our communities um, came to experience the sorrow of war and to live through the atrocities of war. Now, that's the Pacific, the reality of the Pacific. Today, we have a, a so-called geopolitical strategic compass, uh, competition for our part of the Pacific and with the Indo-Pacific community or stretch of countries. Again, not of our doing. Our leaders in the Bowie Declaration recognize a very congested region and highly competed for, for the reasons and expectations of others, but not, not our own, and includes the AUKUS arrangement and other very significant investments in matters military and matters that are going to take place and are taking place deep in our oceans. Again, have we been consulted? Of course not. And the general assumption is that there is no need to consult even amongst forum countries who are involved in these arrangements. But you know, when forum leaders at least five leaders of five island countries first met with Australia and New Zealand back in 1971 in Wellington to establish what we know today as the Pacific Islands Forum. The central concern there uh, was over nuclear testing. The, um, that's a serious matter. And we do know um, that uh, 
you know, uh, our region was the testing ground of weapons of mass uh, destruction. In fact, extensive atmospheric and underground weapons testing over 50 years from 1946 by three different colonial governments in over 10 different sites across the Pacific. 67 atomic and hydro hydrogen bomb tests were exploded in the Marshall Islands alone. I think Joy has already referred uh, to that. Um, and uh, many Pacific countries um, and ocean environments are still suffering from the impacts and the detritus of war and weapons tests and the storage of nuclear waste uh, material. Um, now, but here again, you know, um, 1973, Australia and New Zealand were before the International Court of Justice to argue against French atmospheric tests. Fiji, which has become independent only three years later, was made the first ever intervention application to join that action in support of Australia and New Zealand, 1973. First ever by a small country. Pacific countries have been very, very determined about this. 1985, they've established the Rarotonga Treaty for, uh, to establish a Pacific uh, uh, nuclear-free zone area, second only to the Latin, what they call the Latte Loco Treaty Area in South America. 1985, Treaty of Rarotonga. Have we had all this, have we had full support from all the nuclear countries? No way. But we continue to make this a major position of our region. 1995, New Zealand went back to the International Court of Justice to deal with an announced resumption of nuclear underground testing in Muriro. Samoa, Micronesia, Solomon Islands and Marshall Islands intervened and wanted to join that action. The court would not hear us disgracefully, but we were there knocking on the door and being heard. And the reason is quite simple. Some of us, Samoa, for example, is in the neighborhood of Mururo. We are not going to see people exploding these things in our backyard, as it were. 1996, there was a resolution which all of our countries, resolution of uh, the United Nations General Assembly, as well as of the Council of the WHO uh, for the International Court of Justice to look at the question of the legality of nu nuclear weapons. 1996, we were back island countries before the court to give our submissions and argue our support for that. One of the finest and one of the most detailed submissions was by the Solomon Islands. But Lelay somehow had found some money uh, for a colleague of ours, a professor of international law and me to represent Samoa and to go before the court. And these are the things that in our narrative, we should point out to the world community. We are not witnesses to, to these uh, actions that are of serious concern 
But the thing is, uh, Tuloma, you know, what you've outlined, this underscores yet again the, the enormous trove of information, historical, political, diplomatic, and otherwise, of, of uh, that is not being taught anywhere. This is a whole new Pacific Studies program, which I think that you could launch in every university in the Pacific, whether they're, you know, islanders or not. This is fascinating stuff that people should know the fact that, you know, the smallest countries with the fewest lawyers on the planet actually went to, uh, to the International Court of Justice and other international bodies to argue legal cases so well and so articulately over the years. And so we have to thank you and um, all the others for, for doing this. So as I said, we're running short of time. So if, uh, if, if I could just go around and ask you all for very short closing uh, remarks before we get cut off completely, uh, that would be great. So, so Dame Meg, would you like to... Um, um, have a few closing uh, remarks, please. Thank you very much to um, uh, our colleagues that have presented this morning. And you now I've learned a lot just listening to you all. Uh, I think mine is more a question is where do we take, take this? Where do we go with this? Huh? Because I think that um, um, th there's a synergy, if I may, Katarina, between uh, yours, my thinking, and the earlier part of um, Tuloma's um, suggestions. I think what Joy has raised is, um, you know, it's such a, it's, it's like a pain that we, that a lot of our young people don't know about just what is going on and how, uh, how the militarization of the Pacific is now um, really increasing. And I, I would really like to have a fur further discussions on this because of what's happening in in the Western Pacific and what we're afraid of. But I think that um, <clears throat> we've got a lot of rich, um, rich dialogue here to ca capture. Um, I hope the recording is good because I, many of you at times uh, played it out for me. And since the earthquake, we've had problems with uh, our connections, I know. But uh, I'm not going to say any more than that because my big, the main question for me is how do we move this on? And, and what, what's the vehicle that will drive this? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, I think the only tremors that we felt today was that which came from our speakers such as yourself, Dan Meg. So thank you for that. And um, yes, it is being recorded and um, it'll be edited for time and then made available widely. I think also I'd ask the, uh, I'd tell you to perhaps produce some um, uh, hard copies uh, to have it transcribed so that we can distribute it more widely as we go. So Katerina, some closing remarks. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Kamrapa and Vinaka, everyone. I have to say I'm deeply inspired. I'm excited and I'm deeply inspired. And, and you know, we in Pacific Studies think we know everything, but we don't know everything. So I, I have learned so much today and I've also, I think it's deepened my understanding that actually we are way more on the same page coming from different um, local, national, regional, international contexts and positionalities, but also across time and space historically. Um, what uh, Tuiloma outlined was awesome that whole genealogy of action and activities and negotiations and you know, standing your ground internationally to try to get certain things on the agenda, um, things that they Meg absolutely 100% did you know, in her, in the, uh, during her time at the forum, um, the, his, the histories you outlined and then the actions that were taken you know, under her stewardship this is, I think what Lele said about this being the Pacific, ultimate Pacific studies content that none of us have quite put together in that way is profound. So I'm having a profound pedagogical moment here where we've got, we've got a huge basket in Pacific studies, but we, I don't think we've actually articulated it quite in the way 
that both our two esteemed elders have and brought those elements into the mix because we're often quite suspicious of the of the geopolitical and of the state based you know kinds of ne negotiations and um you know even things like SIDS and thinking about what the potential the possibilities and the consequences are of SIDS but I think this idea of the positivity and and of no apologies about being small about being uh yet still powerful and yet still extremely relevant in that smallness is really important and that that's something coming from Banaba which is six square kilometers you know you can't get smaller you can't get smaller and so I'm I'm overwhelmed with this idea that you went into the Banga Panga into the <laughs> freshwater caves because I know I have been there and I know how small <laughs> the passages are between those caves. And unfortunately, all that fresh water is now polluted by phosphate mining and no one has fresh water on Banaba. But these small spaces tell us so much, so much about the whole ocean and about the whole planet. These small places and small spaces and what goes on at a micro level absolutely is, is relevant to the macro level and to the kinds of complex um, solutions that are required for complex problems. We know how to do that in the Pacific. War came, so complex, is not our war. Nuclear testing came, awful and huge and epic and massive, not our weapons, not our wars, not our fights. Phosphate mining came, I don't even think we got to eat many of the products that were created out of the fertilizer that was used for mass agriculture that required our phosphate. So we who are on the edges and are in the small places know way, way more about the big places and the big powers and the big planetary level sorts of things because it keeps happening to us. So I absolutely agree with Dame Meg and I agree with all of you, with, with uh, Tuiloma and Joy, I'm excited about the ways in which our different voices, experiences, uh, passions, and commitments to Oceania, commitments to the Pacific, the peaceful and the chaotic and the challenging Pacific, I'm excited about how they all come together and intersect and the potential going forward from here. And I, I want to um, tell everyone that we are organizing a big international conference at the ANU in April next year. And we have taken inspiration from an international lawyer, <laughs> Julian Aguan, who wrote an amazing essay called To Hell With Drowning. To Hell With Drowning because climate change keeps, you know, all this global climate change discourse keeps, you know, saying, well, you guys are going down, you guys are going under. And we say to hell with that. You know, we have been surviving for this long in this ocean with all this big drama, with the apocalypse that has come multiple times to our islands and to our lands. We're in apocalypse 4.0 right now. And we know how to live and survive through apocalypse, through displacement, through war, through devastation, through torture, through all kinds of things. We really know how to get through that with resilience and creativity and even still kindness, kindness and hosting and love and understanding of those places and peoples and forces that brought destruction to our islands. That's the other magical superpower that we have is we still will feed you. We still will look after you and be kind to you. So there's so much here and there's so much um, mana. There's so much mana in this space right now. And I wanna thank Yuki who's not here and Lele who's like woven us together and everyone behind the scenes at Tao Tai and el elsewhere. This has been a real moment for me and I'm really humbled. I'm really, really humbled by the different voices and perspectives and the synergies that have come together. Um, I'm, I'm really quite overwhelmed, but also really excited. And I hope some of you can come to Canberra um, next year. 
um, to <laughs> proclaim to hell with drowning <laughs> with all of us. Um, yeah, come Rapa, thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Your, 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 um, your contributions are also memorable for, for, for all of us. And um, it's so comforting to know that you're carrying the torch forward, especially underscoring the fact that, you know, we, we are resilient. We've done lots of things. People should not mistake our respect as weakness. And they certainly shouldn't uh, uh, forget the fact that we're still kind to them as well. As somebody said about Samoan football players, they said, they have a smiling violence about them. <laughs> Let's hope they don't have to use it in the future. Um, moving over to Hawaii again, Joy. What can you tell us? I think we should go forward. Any thoughts yeah. that you can um, leave us with? Mahalo nui loa. Um, it's been so wonderful to listen to, to everyone. Katia, you know, you and I can speak for hours about these things. And uh, mahalo to Dean Meg and to uh, Tui Loma. I think. Uh, yet your framework, Tui Loma, really, you touched on something that I think is incredibly important, which is that we need to have clarity and stand in that clarity. We have it. Uh, it is the rest of the world that is confused. And so when we, they're always shocked when we say no, because they confuse, they, they assume that our kindness, that our aloha, that our love that we share is somehow just supposed to be this ever never ending font to allow them to do whatever they want, which is not what it is. Uh, it's uh, aloha for us also means goodbye. Um, but it's, it's also, we as Pacific people cannot afford to be ahistorical. Uh, the things that you have outlined, the, the, you know, these different treaties, the ways, the times in which we've stood our ground of course, there was a, a particular global context each time those things happened. There, ha there has to be certain worlds converging as well. Uh, I, we are entering that time again, I believe, as they build up, so do we. As they prepare to an assault within, the, in, within their Indo-Pacific, we prepare our cl in clear words what we will not tolerate. And I think there was a time where we were much better able to do that. And I'm wanting that rise to happen again. Uh, I think what's exciting about this period is that there is a newer gener, a younger generation, younger than me, that is now excited and curious and angry about militarization and angry about the devastation to the seas and looking at the root causes of climate change or climate crisis and set, and all roads keep coming back to the same players and all roads keep coming back to uh, the US military, Australian military, these things that keep reoccurring. So how do we, so it's taking that new fresh curiosity and providing them with the clarity and the skills and the organizing to, to take, these, take these things on and I think one of the really important things is understanding all of these things that you've laid out so succinctly. I mean, I could sit and listen to this all day because there are so many moments where empire is interrupted, right? And we know how to interrupt empire. And it is, it is in the small place, it is in the details. It is in those places that are least expected, right? Uh, but a pebble in a shoe, right, hurts. So, you know, we can, we are forever going to be that thorn in their side. Uh, and we are a continent. And, and as that continent, you know, our shelf is rising. Uh, we need, we need to be very clear about what, what will and will not be uh, tolerated, but it comes when we have that history, that knowledge, that re those reminders that are often skipped in many places within the academy. So they must be gained in other places, which is, you know, where I kind of come from <laughs> education. Um, that we need to have all of the tool, we need to use all of the tools available at our, at our fingertips because they're really not that smart. They they glean their intelligence from us. They they have to resort to violence because they have no real thinkers. So it's, it's, it's we 
consistently out outsmart, right? Uh, and they know that. They know that they would have never survived in the Pacific without us. They know that they would never have survived in Indian in any native place, an in Indian indigenous place without us. Uh, and so, and then they, and the greatest trick they ever pulled was to convince us that we didn't know something about ourselves. So we're undoing that, we're unraveling that. Um, but I, I think that what's in, in, important is is being able to say now, yes, what is next? What is next is 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 being stronger, is get, is is really standing the foundations of our of our history, and also to start organizing. Uh, that like or when we organize, we we tend to win. When we when we organize collectively, we tend to win, uh, even though we don't always get along. But we definitely like when we do come together, it's a mighty force. Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you, Joy. With people like you, and the, um, you know, of course, it's going to be a mighty force. Whatever, whatever we put together, and uh, you have a hard job there, and you're doing extremely well. And thank you for that. Um, to Lama, we've uh, got a couple of minutes left for, for a little wrap up from you, please. Gosh, I thought it was half an hour. <laughs> yeah, but you changed the anyway, time, Sam. Um, I changed anyway, the as well. Um, look, very, very quickly, uh, there are uh, next steps. Um, I think uh, Talano is one thing. But the next steps, um, if there is to be any drafting of text, I think um, I think we on our side need to be involved. Uh, I'll leave that thought uh, with you, Lele. Um, so keep us informed. Um, a very useful, Talanoa, but as I say, um, it's important uh, to have the, if the Tallinn law is to be transcribed and, um, and uh, there's need for, for drafting sometime, some appropriate moment, um, you would need to take that on board. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, you've, just, you've just given me more jobs again, as usual. But yes, of course, we should draft something and uh, we'll take a first stab at it. I'll talk to Yuki and then we'll circulate it to everybody. And um, then we can discuss, you know, what sort of, uh, what, it, you know, where we should target it, how we should deliver it. And, and of course, you put it to like, and do it again. Lele, I think Meg, Dame Meg has her hand up. Oh, really? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. And I just wanted to make a comment, uh, Katerina, that seminar you're having next year, I've put in a submit, I've put in an application to do a Talanoa with young people. But after this discussion today, I think it would be really good if we could intersperse it with some of the elders who are, uh, I mean, absolutely, uh, all of us as elders, um, yes. some of us who are on this panel, yes. um, and, and to try and get a richness of that conversation so that Issues that you you raised and Joy and, and also Wilma, uh, particularly about our young people. I mean, I find here now that I'm home and I chair a, a big organisation of on the youth so called the Voice. There's a real gap in their history. They think that the world started um, when they when they were born and after university. The fact that there was all the efforts that went in to get an independent state. It's like. Oh, okay, but now I mean, with, with a lot of education, it's it's happening. But I just wanted to let that, let the others know that, so that if there's anyone interested to be, we let Katerina know. Thank you. Wonderful. I will. Thank make you very much. <laughs> yeah, Katerina, can you put me in with the youth, please, if I come. <laughs> but well, listen, I fit in well. <laughs> I'm running out of time. Look, thank you very much. This has been enlightening for all of us, and it just power of the Talanoa and, the, and that we feed in so many different uh, bits of our culture, our knowledge and our aspirations. So I think that, you know, we should start telling our story about why our oceans need personal, why they sh should be restored. And um, so let's, I'll talk to the uh, Yuki and the Tao Tai people um, and see what we can do about um, moving this along a bit. And also, my grateful thanks to Tao Tai for, for making this possible so quickly. And also to Yuki, whose vision uh, made this possible and her dedication and commitment to this, 
even though she had other things to do, like represent Aotearoa at the Venice Biennale, <laughs> she still had time to get us all together, and we're grateful for that. And of course, we wish her a very speedy recovery. And to you all, thank you very much. Thank you for coming and safe home. And uh, may your gods go with you. Bye.